Thanks everybody for having me. This is my first Waste to Worth conference and I'll say it's been fun so far. I've enjoyed it. I like that I get to speak with other people about manure and people don't look at me like I'm the craziest person on the planet. So um, a lot of what I'm going to cover today is stuff you've heard already, but I'm going to give you kind of the Michigan version. Um, and then the other thing I think that's been really awesome with the tool is some of the outreach and promotional and educational materials we've been able to develop with this tool. So. Just as a quick note, um, I came in about a year and a half ago, and so that was kind of halfway through the grant for this tool. So I'm really glad that Dustin and Heather were able to give a lot of the data background for it um, because I was not a part of that for the Michigan tool. So however, I was able to kind of see through, um, I don't want to say the end result, but, but some of our educational results from that. So. Um, so quickly, I'll go through briefly with you as far as manure application, what that looks like as far as nutrient runoff, um, how these regional runoff risk decision support tools came about, um, and then also some overview as far as what the actual Michigan version of these runoff risk tools looks like. So and, and these, are, these are the um, slides that I present to our conservation districts, to producers, um, NRCS, uh, people who maybe are not as familiar with this. So this is kind of from that standpoint. So what do we know about manure application? What are some of the benefits? It's an alternative fertilizer source and it's readily available from livestock operations. Um, if you have livestock, you're gonna have manure. So, it's a great resource, um, potentially could save money on the commercial fertilizer standpoint if you're able to utilize it effectively on your fields. Some of the planning considerations that we talk about with our producers and um, those that we present this to, what does that manure storage capacity look like? Um, what are the slope and drainage of your fields, of your specific fields? What are some of those weather forecasts and seasonal conditions? We have four seasons in Michigan, sometimes we say two, uh, winter and construction, that tends to be our seasons, but we really do have four seasons in Michigan. And then what are some of the snow and water saturation levels in the fields? Because that can make a big difference as far as the availability of those nutrients to actually soak into the ground. And then the type of manure being applied, is it solid, is it liquid? And we worry about this, or we, we emphasize this because of the idea of nutrient runoff. So, if it rains or if we have snow melt events, these nutrients get into these surface waters um, and they can potentially leach into groundwater too. And so when, when some of these waterways are polluted with these nutrients, it creates um, excess nitrogen and phosphorus and that can be potentially harmful for the aquatic life there and potentially other organisms that access that water source. So a lot of times these harmful algal blooms are born. Um, so you, you've all seen Lake Erie, I'm sure, um, the nice fluorescent pictures from space. And these harmful algal blooms can potentially remove oxygen from the aquatic like that lives in there, which creates these fish kills. Um, and they degrade the quality of drinking water. So we all know that Toledo had kind of a crisis there for a while where they weren't able to access that drinking water efficiently. Um, and then also some of these blooms can produce toxins that can make, um, that can cause illness or irritation for recreational activities that we may do in these, these surface waters. Um, and a fun fact, in Michigan, you're never more than six miles away from some kind of surface water. So we have a lot at stake in our state to make sure we're protecting these waters. So some of the tools um, that have been developed already, which have been touched on, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio all have this Regional Runoff Risk Advisory Forecast Tool. I don't know if this is still 100% accurate. Okay. Um, Illinois, Indiana, a little section of Pennsylvania, and New York. Maybe not Pennsylvania. Not Pennsylvania. Okay. There's some other states that are potentially looking at adopting this tool. It's just a matter of finding the right host. Um, to house the tools. So uh, these tools um, were from the National Weather Service modeling. So they, you know, Dustin and Heather already talked about some of that on-farm research data. Um, and it's a huge multi-partner collaboration. So the Michigan Enviro Impact Tool, we like to say, is a short-term manure application um, decision support tool for farmers. So the other thing that we've been trying to emphasize as well is that this is not just 
um, applicable in the sense of manure. This can be for commercial fertilizer, any kind of nutrient application because the weather forecasting in this doesn't change if you're applying manure or if you're applying commercial fertilizer. So that's kind of an area we've also been kind of reaching out in as well because um, a lot of our crop farmers who maybe don't apply manure could potentially use this tool in that way as well. And we know that that also contributes to some of our nutrient runoff. Um, so, let's see here. So this runoff forecast was derived from real-time precipitation forecast from the National Weather Service, and it combines snow melt, soil moisture, landscape characteristics and such to help determine what that runoff risk looks like. So Michigan, you'll notice across the top, we have different tabs that you can go through. So the furthest left is your actual runoff risk. As you move from left to right, you'll see precipitation. We have soil temperature at two inches, soil temperature at four inches, and then soil saturation. We've been kind of playing around with the soil temperature to see if we want to really do the four inch, um, but that's kind of where we've landed right now. So we're still in discussion as far as what that looks like in the future. But precipitation across the state, it'll show you the actual amount of precipitation, not the percent likely necessarily, but at least gives you an idea of what that precipitation amount looks like in the state. It also has the soil temperature forecast. So in Michigan, we get a lot of frozen ground. And so I know that's not the case for everybody here, but that's something that we have to really consider and emphasize with our producers as well to make sure that if they do apply in the winter, if they have to, this is something to consider. Um, what does the snow melt look like that day? Do you have snow on the field? How frozen is the ground? Are you able to still incorporate that manure potentially? And then we also have soil saturation to look at too. So just because the model potentially says that um, you know precipitation isn't very high that day as far as the amounts, maybe your soil saturation is pretty high and so it still may not be a good day to spread. I always like to refer to our land kind of as a sponge and so when you soak that sponge too much and it absorbs all it can absorb, if you apply more to it, it can't absorb it and it just runs off. So that's why we like to have the ability to show people that sometimes the soil saturation can play a really big role in this as well. So um, with the runoff risk, I know it's not called the non-winter mode, but that's kind of how we refer to it right now. So we have kind of that non-winter mode and winter mode. Um, and I'll show you the winter mode here next, but this is essentially the non-winter mode. Um, and in this, you can see just like the Minnesota tool was showing, we have these four different categories as far as no runoff, low, moderate, and severe. Um, and when you move on to the winter runoff forecast, you can see we actually have more blue and purple at this point. So winter mode kicks in in one of two situations. So the first being that the average snow depth is greater than one inch or the three day average soil temperature is below frozen in the top two inches of soil. So both things could be occurring, but to trigger the winter runoff risk in our tool, it's one of two things. So as Heather was kind of talking about with their tool, um, you're able to actually go in and select, like you could click anywhere on the map in Michigan, and it'll bring this precipitation forecast up for you, and it'll show you um, a seven, a seven day risk essentially of what that runoff will look like. So you can see that say April 22nd probably was not a good day to be out spreading in the Indian Lake, Indian River area in that watershed specifically in Michigan. However, it looks like the next few days after may be okay, but that's where it's good to be able to kind of help in planning in that manure um, or nutrient application. The really nice thing about this map, um, and speaking from experience from not actually being a part of the development of this tool, is that it's a very user-friendly tool, which is really nice because after doing some piloting with farmers, that was something that, that just needed to be a part of the tool. It needed to be really easy to access. It's free, which is another really great thing that is appreciated. Um, but you'll notice, I don't know, I don't think my, if you look on the right-hand side there, there's different, um, layers you can click on and tabs you can click on on the right hand side of the screen here and there's a part where it'll allow you to uh, see how you use this map so like Heather was showing for Minnesota there is a using this map section will, which will actually explain to you in more detail what these different layers look like as far as the 
um, no runoff risk, low, moderate, severe, and then also the winter mode too. And then the other thing that's nice about the tool, um, there's a tutorial that'll take you through step by step how to work the tool and how to navigate the tool, which is really nice. Um, it is pretty user friendly if you just go into it, but the tutorial helps you kind of guide through what that looks like. You can also uh, create an account and sign up for alerts. So when you create your account, um, you just hit log in and it will help you create your own account. When you do that, farmers and producers can actually go in and draw out their own fields. Um, and again, this is not a field specific tool yet, but it at least gives the idea of where that field is located in that runoff um, potential. And then when you sign up, you can also sign up for alerts. So at 6 a.m., um, Anytime there's high runoff risk, I get an alert on my phone and it wakes me up. Uh, and I also get an email about it as well. So for us, if you click on a certain area or if you click on certain fields, you can sign up through there or you can input an address and based on that address within that region, it'll give you that alert. The other thing that we really like to emphasize um, that's kind of been emphasized already as well is while this is a really great tool, it's a really great option, it is still a tool. And so as a farmer, they need to know their field characteristics and what kind of um, best management practices they have in place, because the tool can't account for that. So things like the slope, um, what's the erosion like on that field? You may have one field that's better as far as holding on to that soil than others. What's the phosphorus index? If you've got a if you phosphorus index and we're talking about potential runoff, probably don't want to apply on the field that day. Um, distance to surface water is huge for us because we have a lot of surface water in Michigan. So understanding that some of your fields may be closer to that than others. So if say you're in a moderate risk or a low risk, maybe you don't apply to that field that's right next to that drainage ditch. Maybe you look at one that's a little further inland and maybe is a little flat or something that can actually take that manure without concern about runoff. And then the timing of app application. So solid versus liquid manure. Liquid manure has the propensity to run off a lot faster in some of these situations than solid manure. So some of the um, outreach materials that we've done, uh, Megan Goss is from Michigan Sea Grant and we partnered with them, Michigan State University Extension, to kind of develop these tools. So um, we did, we hosted a webinar in the middle of January to kind of go through this. Um, and we have that actually online on the tool where you can access all of this information. So it kind of gives a detailed description of the tool and it has some good questions on it as well. We also have a postcard, so that's the front and back of it, um, that I bring with me to events. So it's really easy and accessible. A lot of our farmers like the postcard idea because it's a quick flip for them. They can look at it and then explore on their own time. And we also have a two-page fact sheet that we developed um, with the help of Dustin as a part of that. Um, we had a lot of partners that helped us to develop this information. And it's really colorful, which is fun. I'm drawn to things like that. So, and it's easily, easily read. And then we also did create two YouTube videos. They're about three minutes each. One of them's more on the managing of manure application um, and then kind of introduces the Enviro Impact tool. And then there's a user's guide that goes through a little more in depth of how to use the tool and the purpose of the tool. So we're hoping that this will kind of help uh, get the word out about the tool. Um, Dustin actually might be coming to Michigan in July to do uh, a presentation on this. We actually have this uh, for our Ag Innovation Day that Michigan State University is doing. So we're hoping that that'll also help get the tool out there. So, um, so I think I went through pretty quickly, but a lot of it's stuff you had heard already. So if you guys have any specific questions related to the Michigan tool, I'd be happy to answer them now. So yeah, great question. So actually, um, Jason Pawarski, who I should have mentioned, he is kind of the, the web person that's been in charge of this from the Institute of Water Research from Michigan State University. And so he does a lot of the gathering of that. And he signed up for Google Analytics, which he has it sent to me every month as well. So we last I knew, we had 36 actual accounts. Um, but we do have a lot more users that actually come on that just haven't actually signed up for an account necessarily. Um, so that's that's an area we're trying to work through right now. Um, and we have 
We have seen a little bit of an increase since we've gotten out these uh, educational materials, but we just finished them at the very end of January this year. So they're all very, very new for the most part. Um, so we're still kind of working through how to disperse that information and where to disperse that information. Um, so it's, it's lower than we'd like right now, but I do think that's going to increase as more people get a hold of these materials. Yeah. What's the benefit of signing up for an account versus just using the tool officially? Yeah, great question. So benefit of signing up for an account versus just using it um, just through the website itself. With the account, so you can create email alerts without signing up in this tool, but you can't get text alerts. And a lot of our farmers, I mean, that phone goes with them everywhere because it's got a lot of great stuff on it for them and they use it. and so. That's, that's one benefit. The other thing is too, if you don't sign up, you can't draw out your specific fields. If you have a login, you're able to draw out and kind of make it more your own um, based on your farm, where your fields are and, and such. So that would be the benefit. Yeah. You mentioned that they can draw their fields. Mm -hmm. Are they um, actually drawing a polygon or is it just selecting a, a grid parcel or something? That's a good question. I haven't actually myself drawn a field on it yet, um, so I don't know how Jason has that set up for us right now, whether that's a polygon or if it's kind of line by line, you can kind of space it out. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Has any farm used this as a defense? Oh, I spread manure in it, but oh wait, the website said it was okay. And then conversely, has the regulators used this as a... That's, that's a great question. So for those of you who didn't hear, the question was, has this tool been used by farmers um, in case of, say, they had an accidental spill that occurred? Were they able to use this information of a screenshot that day and say, hey, I was okay, according to this tool, and then vice versa, have regulators kind of used it against um, farmers, essentially. So. I, I meant to explain this earlier. So Michigan has what, um, we have the Right to Farm Act like every other state does, except we have what are called generally accepted agricultural management practices. It's just easier to say GAMPs because it's a mouthful. Um, so we have GAMPs that pertain to several different sectors within agriculture, um, but specifically with this tool, it's on the website, we have the manure management and utilization GAMPs. So they're not regulatory, but they are recommendations given that if a farmer is following these recommendations, um, they, it offers them nuisance protection in some cases um, through our Department of Ag. So, it is now officially in our 2019 Manure Management and Utilization GAMS as a decision support tool. Um, but we, and, and Dustin made it clear too, we do not want it to be used as a regulatory tool necessarily. However, there has been discussion of, you know, would our Department of Environmental Quality be okay with this being used if somebody were to take a snapshot that day and say this is what the map looked like the day I spread and then say an accidental spill occurred um, would they be willing to take that as evidence that you know it was an unintentional spill um, and I don't know if we've landed on a solid answer with that yet so those are discussions that we're we're currently having still because it does have a lot of benefits from that. Um, and the thing that I really like about the Minnesota tool, they have an archive in there. And I don't think we have an archive in our tool yet. And that's something that we've been talking about, but we don't have the funding currently. Our funding ran out. So that might be something we'll look into because I think that would be really beneficial. Yeah. So uh, I guess this one is for you and the other, the previous presenters. What are the commonalities and differences with the other tools from the other states in the encoding of the program? And I, I understand that there are different algorithms depending on the area, but what are the commonalities of these with the other states and how we can replicate the, these somewhere else without starting from scratch? Yeah, good question. I might let Dustin kind of answer some of the details of that. Um, I, I think Heather pointed out too some of the some of the actual visuals um, parts that are the same between states. A lot of our legends look the same as far as the actual runoff risk and you know what those categories are and how those categories are put together. But as far as some of the nitty gritty with the, the actual data, that's probably more up Dustin's alley. Yeah, so the underlying model um, is actually a continental U.S. model, and so it's available for farmers. Same 
response. So um, the reason we don't allow them to do it outside of their businesses is we only have funding to work with the business in GMP and um, To expand outside that footprint would be our version of free tool, which is um, the national water model to be available across the entire country in the US. And that would be an opportunity for three to four five years to expand. Thank you for speaking on that side. Thank you.